All right, guys. So um, the next few sections in the AP Bio curriculum, 4.2, 4.3, and 4.4, all really fit together pretty well. And I'm not in a good spot where I feel like it's easy to break them into one or another and do two separate videos on them. So I'm just going to do them all together. We'll call it part two, 4.2, and 4.3, signal transduction. Let's get moving. So let's do a brief overview of signaling. Um, cells receiving signals go through three main processes. One, they got to receive the signal, right? The target cell detects a signaling molecule right here that binds to receptor protein on the cell surface. So that's the first step. Signal's got to get there and bind. Okay. Transduction. Now that we have the cell, the signal bound here, now we need to transmit that signal through the cell to wherever the target um, organelle or chemical process is, and that's called transduction. The binding of the signaling molecule alters the receptor. The thing will change shape, uh, which initiates a signal transduction pathway, uh, which usually occurs in a series of steps, which are important, and we'll talk about those as we go. Um, the last thing then, you got all the signaling here. The whole point is to get a response, to get that target cell to do something. So that transduced signal triggers a specific response in the target cell. Um, here we can see a picture. We got inside the cell, outside the cell, cell membrane. Here is the receptor, and here's the signaling molecule called a ligand. When that attaches, it causes a change here, which initiates a transduction pathway. And you see one molecule changes the shape of the next molecule, changes the shape of the next molecule, which eventually leads to a cellular response on the other end. Okay, let's watch a video here that uh, kind of shows that with some motion, which I think will be Cells communicate with one another by means of chemical signals. For the receiving cell, there are three stages in the signaling process. Reception, transduction, and cell response. The cell targeted by a particular signal has a receptor molecule complementary to the signal molecule or ligand. The ligand fits like a key in a lock and triggers a change in the receptor molecule. Signal transduction converts the change in the receptor to a form that can bring about a cellular response. This might involve a series of steps, a signal transduction pathway that alters and amplifies the change. In the third stage of cell signaling, the transduction process brings about a cellular response. This can be any of many different cellular activities such as activation of a certain enzyme, rearrangement of the cytoskeleton, or activation of specific genes. Um, at this point, if you haven't already done so, you should work on the 4.1 topic questions on AP Classroom. All right, reception. Uh, the signaling molecule uh, binds to a receptor protein, causing it to change shape. That's the basics of what's going on here. The binding between the signaling molecule, otherwise known as a ligand, and the receptor is very specific. Shape is very important here. If you got the right shape, you fit. If you got the wrong shape, you don't. Okay. A shape change in the receptor is often initiated, uh, is the initial transduction of the signal. So this binds here and it causes a change in shape on this end of the molecule inside the cell. That's how you get the, the signal from the outside to the inside. The ligand doesn't travel inside, but it causes this transmembrane protein to change shape on the inside. And so most of those signal receptors are plasma, member pro plasma membrane proteins. All right, so receptors in the plasma membrane. Most water-soluble signal molecules bind to specific sites on the receptor proteins um, that span the plasma membrane, like we mentioned before. Three main types that we're going to talk about in here. There are more, but these are the three biggies. Uh, G protein coupled receptors, receptor tyrosine kinases, and ion channels. And we'll start with the G protein coupled receptors. Okay, these are the largest family of cell surface receptors. Um, they're surface transmitting receptors that work with the help of a G protein. That's why they call G protein coupled receptors. They are not themselves G proteins, but they are coupled to G proteins in order to work. G proteins bind uh, the energy-rich GTP molecule. Uh, very similar, um, you can think of it as like ATP and ADP. We have GDP uh, with two phosphorus and GTP with three phosphorus on it. Um, and the G proteins are all very similar in structure. 
Um, and these systems are extremely widespread and diverse in their functions. Uh, we think they're pretty early evolvers. We can find them in lots of different things. We just tweak a few little things to make them work for this system or make them work for that system. Here we can see a uh, model one over here. It's a lot of alpha helixes. We got a binding site on the outside and the segment on the inside, which will interact with the G protein. Here we can see a nice diagram of what's going on. So here is the system at rest. Outside the cell, inside the cell, we've got the uh, receptor. We've got the G protein in its inactive state. It's bound to a GDP molecule, not a T molecule. And here's the enzyme that that G protein is going to activate. So when things get started, our ligand comes in and binds to the receptor, which activates that. The G protein comes over and a GTP comes in and displaces a GDP. We're not um, adding on a phosphorus right here. We're just literally replacing one molecule with the other. Then that molecule, that G protein, can diffuse through the fluid mosaic of the phospholipid membrane, bind up with the enzyme, which will cause that enzyme to change shape and cause a, a cellular response. Then that phosphorus will get broken off the GDP and it'll return to GDP and reset back to the beginning. You don't want that phosphor, extra phosphorus to stay in here for too long or you'll get stuck in this position, okay? So instead of being able to trigger a single response, it'll just kind of sit there and keep telling the cell, do this, 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 even though the cell doesn't need to keep doing it, okay? We have to be able, that's one thing that's key in all these transduction pathways that we're gonna be talking about is you gotta have a way to end them, okay? You wanna be able to send them, but you don't want them to get stuck in that on position. You gotta be able to reverse it and end the signal so you can stop whatever reaction it was. Uh, tyrosine kinases or receptor tyrosine kinases, RTKs, are membrane receptors that attach phosphates to tyrosine, okay? Um, kinases are proteins that attach phosphates to things, okay? Um, in this case, we're attaching to tyrosine, hence tyrosine kinase. Uh, and interesting thing about this one is it can trigger multiple signal transduction pathways at once, whereas the G protein one generally just does one process. This one can do a bunch of different things at the same time. Sometimes you want that. You want your one hormone attaching to the outside to trigger your cell to do this, and you should also do that. We're going to need both those things to happen. So in that case, a tyrosine kinase receptor is the type you're going to want to use. Um, if these don't function right, it's associated with many types of cancer too. So you can see a nice diagram. We got outside the cell, inside the cell. Here are tyrosines on our kinases. They often come in pairs. So here's our ligand binding site. Both of those have to get bound to get activated. And when they do, they come together and form a dimer. That then allows this thing to pull six phosphoruses off of ATP and bind them up to the tyrosines. Now it's in its active state and it can bind to these activated relay proteins, which are gonna then carry signals off to the cell to do something else. And because we have so many of these binding sites, we can actually trigger one or two or three or whatever cellular responses from this one initial binding of ligand up here. Lastly, uh, ion channel receptors. Um, these are ligand gated ion channels. So they're ion channels that open up when a molecule attaches to it, a ligand. Um, there are other types of gated ion channels. There's uh, uh, voltage gated ion channels, for instance, which uh, we see a lot of in the nervous system and the muscular system in humans. Uh, but the ligated ion channel act as a gate when the receptor changes shape. Okay. So when a signal molecule binds to the ligand to the receptor, the gate will open up and allow the specific ion like sodium or calcium to rush through the channel in the receptor down its concentration grade again. Um, and that'll generate some form of a change in the cell. So here we can see uh, high concentration of the ions outside. There's the ligand, here's the gate. Ligand attaches, causes a conformation change in the protein, opens up. The ion can flow down its concentration gradient, which will trigger some form of a cellular response. Ligand releases, gate closes, and we start all over again. There can be intracellular receptors or receptors that aren't on the surface of the membrane. 
Um, if that is the case, the molecule, the ligand, has to be able to cross the plasma membrane. Um, so it needs to be small or hydrophobic to do that. Um, and these um, so examples of these would be steroids and thyroid hormones. Okay, um, They can cross the membrane. Then you have some receptor protein somewhere in the cytosol. Okay. Binds to that. And then it can carry out the cellular response. What you often see in these ones is those ones, when it binds, it activates a, a transcription factor. Okay. A transcription factor is a protein that tells a specific gene in the DNA to start transcribing mRNA to make a particular protein. So this is how you can control when a gene gets turned on or turned off, when a gene makes a protein or doesn't make a protein with this type of cell communication. All right, so now we've gotten that signals in, kind of got an overview. Let's dig deeper into this transduction. Transduction usually involves cascades of molecular interactions, which relay signals from the receptor to the target molecules in the cells. We can think of them like dominoes. When this one falls, it causes the next one to fall, which hits the next one and the next one and the next one on down the line until you get things done. Usually multiple steps. Um, benefits to multiple steps, they can greatly amplify a signal, meaning one ligand can trigger, you know, a million glucoses to get broken down, for instance, um, or is it 100 million? It's a lot. I've got a diagram later on in here that shows that. These multi-step pathways also provide more opportunities for coordination and regulation of the cell process. It's not just this changes and then the cell responds. You got all these steps in the middle. All those steps in the middle allow you to um, have a little more fine-tuned control over the response and regulate it. Like you might need this chain to be activated, but it won't go all the way to the end unless something else over here is also activated. Okay. So that you kind of have a checks and balances. This needs to be activated and this needs to be activated in order to get the response, for instance. The binding of a signaling molecule to receptor triggers that first step in the chain reaction of molecular interactions. Like the falling dynamos, dynamos, <laughs> like the falling dynamo, dynamos. I can't talk, guys. Like falling dominoes, the receptor activates another protein, uh, which activates another and another and so on. Uh, at each set, the signal is transduced into a different form, okay, which is usually the change in shape of a protein. We've talked about that all year long. Proteins, I have the ability to change shape, is huge in molecular biology. Uh, a lot of this happens with protein phosphorylation or dephosphorylation. Uh, phosphorylation is adding on a phosphate. Dephosphorylation is removing a phosphate. Um, and that can cause a protein... Um, to go from an active state to an inactive or inactive to active. And different ones get activated when you add a phosphate or they get deactivated uh, when you add a phosphate. Go both ways. Those protein kinases we talked about before uh, transfer the phosphates usually from an ATP to a protein and we call that phosphorylation. Many really molecules and signaling transduction pathways are protein kinases for this reason and you get something called a phosphorylation cascade when that happens. As we can see here, there's our signaling molecule, our ligand, our receptor, a relay molecule, and we have an inactive protein kinase, gets activated, and that one is gonna transfer an a, a phosphorus onto protease kinase two, and onto three, onto four, and all the way down until you get here, a phosphorylation cascade. Every one of these gets activated by adding a phosphorus, which is caused by the one before, making that change. Um, like we've said, you can't leave those things stuck, though. You've got to be able to reverse it. So we have protein phosphatases, uh, which remove those phosphates from proteins very rapidly. So um, they can trigger that next response, and that's about it before they break down. Um, and they act kind of like a molecular switch, turning activities on or off, up or down as we go through. There are things we call second messengers. Um, that are not proteins, um, small molecules and ions. I'm not sure why they don't call them secondary messengers, but I've, in the readings I've done, it's all called second messengers. Uh, so many signaling pathways involve these second messengers. They're small, non-protein, water-soluble molecules or ions that spread throughout a cell via diffusion. 
Uh, and they participate in pathways initiated by G protein coupled receptors and um, the tyrosine kinases that we talked about. Um, a couple of common ones that we'll focus on are cyclic AMP, otherwise known as CAMP, and calcium ions. Cyclic AMP, CAMP, is one of the most widely used secondary messengers, second messengers. Um, adenyl cyclase is an enzyme in the plasma membrane. Okay. That converts ATP to CAMP. It's not really about getting the energy out of the ATP. It's using ATP as a substrate to make what you want to make. So it takes that ATP, adenylene, adenyl cyclase, okay, pulls off a couple of those phosphates and makes CAMP. Okay, and it's called cyclic. We got this little circular, circular structure in here um, and double bonding in there as well. Um, It's kind of like baking soda, right? Um, baking soda, you mainly use it for getting in baking to make things rise, but you can also use it to clean your counters, clean your teeth, uh, get smells out of your fridge. Okay, it's got a main job, but if it's around, we can use it for lots of other things that it helps with too. Same thing here with ATP. Mainly we use it for energy, but we can also use it as a base to make cyclic AMP. Same basic idea. Many signal molecules trigger the formation of CAMP. Uh, CAMP usually activates uh, protein kinase A, which phosphorylates various other proteins. So it starts that uh, phosphorylation cascade that we mentioned earlier. Uh, further regulation of cell metabolism is provided by G protein systems that might inhibit adenyl cyclase. So you can turn adenyl cyclase on or you can inhibit it. And so you can, can turn things on or off. You gotta be able to do both in the body guys so we've got our first messenger our ligand attaches the g protein coupled receptor activates our g protein binds up with gtp activates the dental cyclase which makes camp which can get kinase a going and you get your whole phosphorylation cascade leading to a cellular response so understanding the role of camp and g protein signaling pathways helps explain how certain microbes cause diseases I don't expect you to remember this example, but I think it's kind of an interesting example of it. Uh, cholera bacterium. Um, that's the one that makes people have severe diarrhea and die from dehydration. Um, super deadly in the past until we got good sanitation. So that cholera bacterium, Vibrio cholerae, uh, produces a toxin that modifies a G protein, so it's stuck in its active form. It gets stuck with the GTP on it. It doesn't break off that extra T. And that means it's going to get stuck on the adenyl cyclase. Okay. So that modified G protein continually makes camp. When it does that, the intestinal cells secrete large amounts of salt in the intestines. Large amount of salts in the intestines means your water differential has changed. Water is going to get sucked out of the tissues and in the intestines where you then poop it out um, and get dehydrated and can eventually die if you're not treated properly. So just that one little bitty change in the signaling pathway can have drastic downstream effects. No pun intended with the cholera, by the way. It can have drastic effects, though, um, going forward. So, and this is how a lot of diseases um, are caused, how a lot of bacteria affects us and toxins affect us, is they mess with something in this transduction pathway so that we can't carry out the normal body functions the way we need to. Um, another second messenger we mentioned was calcium ions, uh, which also use IP3, um, and they act in uh, second messengers in many pathways. Um, part of the reason it can function so well is its concentration in the cytosol of the cell is normally much lower than the concentration outside the cell or in the endoplasmic reticulum. Picture I have in a second shows it pretty well. So if you can open up an ion channel um, you can cause a very rapid change in concentration of calcium, which can trigger a response. So here we can see blue is high calcium, low is this orangish color. So we can see we get lots of calcium outside the cell and a high concentration in the endoplasmic reticulum. And our bodies, our cells are constantly trying to pump calcium out of the cytosol and into these other reservoirs. So we have a big concentration difference. And so what that allows is we can get a situation like this. So here we've got our signal, our G protein coupled receptor, activates the G protein, 
which activates uh, phospholipase C, which breaks off this molecule, which then opens up a calcium channel, a ligand graded calcium channel, allowing calcium to rush through, causing a cellular response. Here's a video that kind of shows some of those here a little bit better, so we'll watch that. Receptors that are plasma membrane proteins usually affect the cell through multi-step signal transduction pathways. These pathways allow for amplification of signals and signal coordination and regulation. Signal transduction often involves smaller molecules called second messengers and protein phosphorylation by enzymes called protein kinases. Second messengers are small non-protein molecules that act as intermediaries in signal transmission. Two important second messengers are cyclic AMP and calcium ions. Cyclic AMP acts as a second messenger in pathways initiated by both G-protein-linked receptors and receptor tyrosine kinases. The hormone epinephrine acts via cyclic AMP as a second messenger. An epinephrine molecule docks with a receptor protein, which acts through a G protein to activate the enzyme adenylyl cyclase. Adenylyl cyclase converts ATP into cyclic AMP, or CAMP, which quickly diffuses through the cell and triggers further steps in the signaling pathway. In this cell, we show it activating a protein kinase. Calcium ions also act as second messengers in signal transduction pathways. This time we will show a receptor tyrosine kinase, but G-protein linked receptors can also initiate release of calcium ions. The signal molecule docks with the receptor and activates an enzyme called phospholipase C. The enzyme cleaves a small molecule called inositol trisphosphate, IP3, from a certain kind of membrane phospholipid. IP3 docks with a calcium channel on the endoplasmic reticulum. The channel opens, releasing calcium ions into the cytoplasm, where they activate proteins that carry out cell responses. Enzymes called protein kinases are important links in many signal transduction pathways. A protein kinase catalyzes the transfer of phosphate groups from ATP to another protein. More often than not, the activated protein is also a protein kinase, which may act on still another protein kinase. One kinase may activate many molecules of the next type of kinase in the chain, thus amplifying the signal until the last kinase activates many molecules of the protein that carries out the final cellular response. If you haven't already done so, now would be a good time to take a look at your 4.2 topic questions. Uh, we should have enough information at this point to answer those well. So now we've received the signal, we've transduced it or, or sent it through the cell, now we're ready to have a response. And we also want to talk about how we can regulate that response. Okay. Uh, the responses can either be nuclear or cytoplasmic responses. Ultimately, a signal transduction pathway leads to regulation of one or more cellular activities. Uh, that's the output response. Response may occur in the cytoplasm out here, or it can happen in the nucleus um, where you're turning on or off genes, okay, with those um, transcription factors we talked about. So the ultimate um, end product would be turning on a gene to make a protein or turning off a gene. So it doesn't make a protein. So that's when it's a nuclear one, or it can do something in the cytoplasm. Other pathways regulate the activity of enzymes rather than their synthesis. For example, a signal could cause an opening or closing of an ion channel um, or change cell metabolism. Um, and it can also regulate cell division, which we'll talk about in the next chunk of the unit. So a response isn't necessarily just a simple on off. There are four different things that we can control when we're trying to regulate a response. We can amplify the signal, meaning one ligand could cause thousands or millions of cell responses. We need to be very specific in the response, so some cells respond and others don't, or some parts of the cell respond and other parts don't. We can make the signal very efficient by enhancing it with scaffolding proteins, which we've actually talked about before, even though we didn't call them scaffolding proteins, we talked about photosynthesis and respiration, so we'll get to that in a second. And we need to be able to, like we talked about, 
earlier in this unit, terminate that signal, break it down so it doesn't keep going. So first off, amplification, um, enzyme cascades amplify the cell's response to a signal. At each step, the number of activated project products is much greater than in the preceding step. So we have one molecule ligand at reception. And as you see, as we go through this transduction pathway, at each step, we vastly increase the amount of product until we get to the end and we've got glucose 1-phosphate in the amount of 10 to the eighth molecules from one. It's nuts. So amplification is huge. Okay. Also specificity, which we've talked about in the past a bit, different kinds of cells have different collections of proteins. These different proteins allow cells to detect and respond to different signals, like your heart responds to epinephrine, but your earlobe doesn't. Um, that same signal can have different effects in cells with different proteins and pathways. So you can have one hormone causes this cell to grow, but causes that cell just to increase its metabolism, for instance. Okay. Um, and we can also have pathway branching and crosstalk, uh, which further helps the cell coordinate incoming signals. I'll explain them with the picture we have next. So here's kind of the standard one we've been talking about. Signaling molecule, receptor, transduction pathway, response. Here, we can get multiple responses from one signal. Okay. So we can branch it off and get different responses from the same original signal. Here, we, have, we need two different signals to get this thing to work or to inhibit it. Okay, you either need to have this one and this one in order for it to progress past this point, or maybe this one will go unless this one gets activated. If this one gets activated, it blocks it. So we can have some checks and balances there. Or we can have a completely different response with a completely different receptor protein that is still able to bind with a ligand. Um, scaffolding proteins um, are largely relay proteins, uh, which other relay proteins are attached. Um, we want these molecules, since this one triggers the next one, triggers the next one. If we can make sure they're all right next to each other, they don't have to diffuse around looking for, oh, where is my, my next relay runner in this race? It's over there. I better go over there. No, they're all right together. We saw that in the um, photosystems and the electron transport chains in um, photosynthesis of cell respiration. We bundle those molecules together, close together, so that the reaction can happen efficiently. And then we need to terminate this signal. Uh, there's a lot of different interact, inter, inactivation mechanisms um, with this. Um, one of them, which is if the ligand concentration falls, like you get less epinephrine in your blood, fewer receptors will be bound, and those unbound receptors revert to the inactive state, and you no longer have a response. If you haven't already worked on your 4.3 topic questions, now would be the time to do that. Uh, last thing I want to talk about here, guys, is apoptosis which is a fun sounding word for programmed cell death. Um, cells that are infected or damaged um, or have reached the end of their functional lives undergo programmed cell death. You need to, okay? Um, you don't want the cell just kind of hanging around and, and messing things up and using energy when it's not doing any good. So the components of the cell are chopped up and packaged into vesicles that are digested by scavenger cells. And this is important because if the cell just kind of falls apart and disintegrates, all those enzymes and signaling molecules and all that kind of stuff just gets barfed out into the intracellular spaces um, and can cause wreak all sorts of havoc with the signaling mechanisms and the metabolism and everything else going on in the cells around it and really mess things up for the other cells. So you want to contain that. It's kind of like toxic waste, right? You don't just toss it in the river, okay? It's going to cause all sorts of downstream negative effects. You want to package it up properly, transport it properly, take it somewhere where they can convert it into something that is not going to harm anything. Same type of deal with apoptosis. All right, apoptos pop, ew, apoptotic pathways and the signals that trigger them. Um, there's a lot of different ones. You don't need to know the numbers, but there's a lot of different mechanisms that can carry out apoptosis. It can be triggered by signals outside the cell or inside the cell. Okay. Generally, those internal signals are result from irreparable DNA damage or excessive protein misfolding. So um, the cell's got internal monitoring going on. And if things aren't going right, the cells say, eh, hit the self-destruct button, guys. We're, we're going out of control. We better stop this thing. Um, that's the inside one. Outside, you may get a signal to start growing to repair a cut um, or go through a growth spurt and things of that nature. 
Um, well, that's the growth, not the death. But you may get the signal to die. I'll talk about that later. Um, it has to do with fingers and production. Here it is. Um, when we are developing as an embryo, in, even as humans, the first things we develop are things that look like little fins, okay, like this. Okay. It's It harkens back to how we evolved from things that had fins. But we need to then get rid of this connecting tissue. We don't want that webbing between our fingers. So we actually can trigger apoptosis in that tissue so that it dies and we're left with our separate fingers spacing there. Um, so we want it to happen um, in certain places. Apoptosis may be involved in some diseases like Parkinson's and Alzheimer's. And very last thing, guys, changes in signal pathways. What could go wrong? Well, you could have some mutations um, in any part of a receptor protein or its pathway may affect the downstream components by altering the transduction of the signal. And either the signal doesn't get moved along properly, we don't get the right response, or nothing happens. And that's the basis for many genetic diseases, actually. Or chemicals can affect those pathways. Um, we talked about it already with the cholera one. But think of cholera, toxins, poisons, and those kind of things. And that will do it, folks, on 4.4. Topic questions there if you haven't yet. And that is the end of this section of the notes. Next section notes, we'll start talking about cell feedback and the cell cycle. See you then.